Hello, students. Today, we are very lucky to have Tony Rice with us. Tony is from NASA. He's an information security engineer and Virginia Tech alumni working at a telecommunications company in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina. His career has spanned various areas of research and development in software engineering, analytics, and information security. He speaks in classrooms, area museums, and libraries. He helps broadcast meteorologists across the country uh, and share the, to share the night sky with their viewers. He's a frequent guest on local television in Raleigh, um, discussing current NASA missions and astronomical phenomenon. It has been known to hold impromptu sidewalk astronomy sessions with passersby. Today, Tony will be speaking about the weather on Mars. And this is something that you will want to take note of when you are planning your human mission to Mars. So, uh, Mr. Rice, you have the floor and you may share um, your screen if you need to. Thank you very much. Yes, I have some cool slides to share. So let me go ahead and get those started. And we'll have some time at the end for questions, definitely. Um, so I understand that you're you're working on some projects that uh, ask the question about you know, what it's going to take to be able to put human on humans on Mars, and one factor that sometimes gets overlooked is the weather. Uh, yes, there is weather on Mars. We're going to talk about that. Some I'll give you some examples of of the weather. Uh, there are some things about it that are very very much like Earth, and there's the, some things that are quite a bit different. Uh, but the one thing that they definitely share is the physics. The physics works the same way on Mars as it does on Earth, and we'll see some of that. Uh, so, you know, first of all, when we we look at this picture here, this is a, a an artist rendition of what uh, a human settlement might look like on Mars, and I like this one a lot because it. It shows some of the vehicles that we might uh, be using. We'll definitely have to travel in you know, pretty good sized vehicles. Uh, the reason being Mars is so big and it's so desolate. Uh, but another reason is that atmosphere. We can't just jump out of a, a spacecraft, open it up and expect to be able to walk around there. The atmosphere there is not something that humans can breathe mostly because of its composition. It is mostly carbon dioxide, which is uh, not exactly what we need. Works great for trees and you know perhaps that's uh, something you can, can consider in your, your other thoughts about how we put music, uh, humans on Mars. We take advantage of the fact that there's a lot of carbon dioxide there because that's something that plants very much like, but our human bodies don't like that very much. So we're going to have to take uh, some atmosphere with us and we're going to have to make some atmosphere there. Uh, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let's look at what's going on on Mars and what it looks like today in terms of the weather. Go ahead and jump into it. Uh, so the first thing I want to share with you is is Mars has clouds, believe it or not. Uh, some of those clouds, if we were to look through a telescope and view Mars, uh, what would look like clouds to us, those are you know, probably dust being held in the atmosphere. And that happens periodically. Uh, we have some pretty large dust storms that occur and you're seeing that a little bit over on the left-hand side uh, in those images that have been put together from uh, the Mars Color Imager aboard the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. Uh, that's one way that we can monitor the weather on Mars, particularly looking at those clouds, is through uh, orbiters that are circling Mars right now. We've got a number of those, uh, but we'll see uh, actually clouds made of water ice, just the same thing that clouds here on Earth are made of. They tend to be very, very thin, uh, and that's because the atmosphere is very, very thin. Uh, the uh, We measure the amount of atmosphere that is present uh, based on atmospheric pressure. And you might have heard that term when you watch the evening news, they talk about what the pressure is, high pressure systems, low pressure systems. That's a measurement for the, the amount of, of air, amount of uh, atmosphere that's pressing down on you at any point in time. Mars has about one one hundredth the atmosphere that Earth does. We measure that with the pressure. And we're gonna see some of those numbers in a minute. But you know, the first thing to, to think about is Mars does have clouds. Here's another view of, of those clouds, uh, water ice clouds that I mentioned, and some of those dust clouds that get kicked up. Uh, now, there are actually dust cloud seasons that occur when uh, the, the dust tends to hang in the atmosphere. It's stirred up 
by the winds. Uh, Mars does have some very, very gentle winds, again, because there's not a whole lot of atmosphere. It's, if you were able to walk around Mars without a spacesuit on, you would not feel the wind at all. There's just not enough molecules, air molecules there that are moving around. But the dust is so fine on the surface of Mars, uh, about the uh, the texture of, say, flour, if you've made, uh, uh, you know, baked uh, bread or, or, or baked cookies or whatever, the flour that you use there, that's about the consistency of it. Uh, but it can get electrostatically charged and brought up into the atmosphere. It just kind of hangs there to the point where it will completely block out the sun in some cases. We consider this to be part of the weather. What you're looking at here is kind of a flattened version of the Mars globe uh, from uh, an instrument like Marcy, like the color imager that's aboard that orbiter. And this allows us to watch the, uh, the ice clouds as they move around. Something else that's pretty fascinating is Mars has tornadoes, very small tornadoes. Uh, they're better called dust devils. These things happen on Earth too. Uh, but what I've got here is a, an animation that was created uh, over time of several dust devils that occurred in front of the Perseverance rover. And you know, I've got my Perseverance shirt on today. The Mars 2020 um, mission is, is uh, the larger name for the Perseverance rover. But Perseverance is very similar to another rover called Curiosity. And we'll see some images from Curiosity as well. These were taken by um, one of Perseverance mini cameras. And what you're seeing are dust devils. They're, some people call them whirlwinds. Uh, there's a number of different names for them, but they're basically tiny little tornadoes that we see on Mars. Let me show you a couple more. Uh, actually, the one I'm gonna show you now, if you've got your, um, uh, your audio on, you might wanna turn it up a little bit because you're about to hear the sound of one of those dust devils. And what you're hearing is actually the dust devil passing over the rover. And we can tell that by uh, looking at the, position it again, um, if it'll let me do it, there we go. Uh, we can tell that by looking at the atmospheric pressure that changes as the dust devil goes over. So if you look right here, this dip in atmospheric pressure, there's a lower pressure system right inside the middle of that dust devil. Same kind of thing that we see on Earth with tornadoes. Now notice in this, this image here, the raw image and then the process image, uh, that particular dust devil was about between 50 and 60 meters away. You don't really see it too well in that raw image. So sometimes the only re reason we know that a dust devil occurred uh, is because of the monitoring of the atmospheric pressure. But when you actually see it, such as in the you know, previous animation I showed, and I'll show you a couple more, uh, what we're seeing is the dust up in the atmosphere that's being carried by the, the dust devil. So let's look at a few more of them. Uh, so here's a couple more. Um, this is from the rover Curiosity uh, back in 2017. And there's two separate dust devils here, um, the, or two, two different images. The, the top one was on February, and then down here, the bottom one uh, was taken at a slightly different time. This is my favorite one by far, though. And the reason I like it so much, uh, this is again Curiosity in, in February of 2017, is this dust devil kind of turns a corner here and goes around the, the backside of this, this little hill uh, behind the rover. And you can see part of the rover here. Uh, this thing down here with the fins, um, that's where the rover gets its power from. It's a uh, a decaying nuclear isotope uh, that gives off heat that the rover is able to turn into energy. And you know, that'll power it for a good long time. So let's kind of dig into what causes a dust devil a little bit. Uh, this is another image taken by um, the Perseverance rover uh, in actually you know, 2012, this would have been Curiosity. And this is on Sol 109. You'll see the word Sol mentioned on these slides quite a bit. Uh, a Sol is a Martian day, it's a little bit longer than a Earth day. Uh, when you see the word Sol, uh, it's going to be specific to whatever mission we're talking about. We use Sols to number the Martian days uh, that a mission has been there. So Sol 109 for Curiosity is different than Sol 109 for Perseverance, for example. We start numbering on the day that the mission began, the mission landed there. 
But what you're looking at right now is a part of a larger uh, image that was put together, was stitched together from a lot of other images that were taken uh, by some of the higher resolution cameras on board this, this spacecraft. Uh, and this is what it would look like if you were standing on Mars. Uh, the, everything has kind of a brownish tan hue to it. And again, that's because of the dust. Uh, the dust in the air you know, kind of changes the, the, the way the light works and everything looks kind of tan. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take that to a filter that uh, makes it look like if we were standing here on earth, because uh, we're gonna compare this to some earth weather. Uh, and we're gonna talk about why uh, dust devils happen. Uh, and why they can happen on Earth too. Uh, the ingredients for a dust devil to occur, these little mini tor tornadoes are the same. Uh, you've got to have some heating of the ground. It typically happens on very flat surfaces such as this, and we'll see them in the desert. I was just out in uh, Barstow, California a couple of weeks back visiting a NASA facility, and we saw dust devils all over everywhere because they're in the middle of the desert. And you've got the hot sun, it was about 110 degrees at the time and it creates this, the, the right conditions. Let's talk about those conditions. So obviously you've got the sun. The sun is gonna heat up the earth, the, the soil, um, the sand or the dust in the case of, of Mars or the rock. And that causes that heat to rise. And as that heat rises, it's bringing some of the atmosphere with it. And as it rises and brings that atmosphere, it creates a low pressure system because that, that air is moving away and taking some of those air molecules away with it. And it creates that low there. At the same time, if there's low pressure, the higher pressure around it, that air is gonna rush in and fill in that low pressure system. And that can cause some rotation. Because as you see here, this isn't perfectly flat. That air is gonna be coming in from different directions. And as a result, it might create a little bit of rotation. And when that happens, you get this, you get a dust devil. Um, they're very, very small, generally, um, just a couple of feet across, and they don't last very long, um, maybe a minute or two at the most, especially on Mars where things happen kind of fast because of the physics of what's going on there. Uh, they tend to fall apart very quickly because cooler air comes in, uh, not only filling in that area of, of low pressure and kind of equalizing the air pressure there, but it also returns it to a, a more normal temperature. Uh, so just as quickly as those things will spin up, and I, I, I choose that word specifically, they will spin back down as the, the dust devil falls apart. Um, that being said, we do sometimes see some really big ones. So this was taken again by that high rise camera on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. Um, so we, we do see these sometimes from orbit. And the map down in the lower left will show you about where this was. It's pretty far away from uh, where we have some of the other assets, some of the other rovers and, and other missions that are on the ground. But um, the, the dust devil itself was about 30 meters across, which is pretty big. And it stretched out as the winds kind of pushed it along over 400 meters. So they can get a little bit big. So I've, I've referenced these robots a couple of times and I, I should point out a few things about them. This is the Perseverance rover. Uh, this is the one that has most recently landed on Mars. It's also part of the, the Mars 2020 mission. It is very, very similar to the Curiosity rover, also known as the Mars Science Laboratory. It has a lot of the same things. The instrument we're gonna focus here on today is the NETA instrument. And that's right there on the, the mast, or you know, since it kind of looks like a, a one-eyed uh, robot there, we, we think of it kind of as a neck. Uh, but you know, let's look at some of the instruments there and, and what they can tell us about the weather on Mars. So first of all, there's two wind sensors. And they're about the size of, of say, like a highlighter, a little bit bigger, um, magic marker, something like that. And they're positioned in a way that allows any wind coming from any direction to be measured. And we don't have to worry about the, the neck of the robot getting in the way, if you will. There's infrared sensors that you know, tell us how much you know, solar radiation is making it to the ground. There's humidity sensors. We're, we're measuring what little humidity there is in the atmosphere. And of course, there's several air temperature sensors. There's five of them. You see three here uh, on, the, uh, on the neck of the robot. There's two more on the body uh, that are measuring a little bit closer to the ground. And if we compare that to a set of instruments that we might use here on Earth to measure the weather, 
it's measuring some of the same things. We, we measure solar radiation. Uh, we measure the air temperature, of course, uh, air pressure, which is one of the most interesting things about the Mars atmosphere is that that air pressure, again, about one one hundredth that of Earth, and of course, ground temperature. Uh, so again, things work the same way on Mars as they do on Earth. Uh, and this is not the first time that we've sent robots with uh, meteorological packages on them, with weather instruments on them. Uh, most recently, the InSight rover had basically the same kind of uh, instruments. It was the the same things that we had placed on Curiosity and on Perseverance. We placed on the InSight mission as well. This is a lander. It didn't move around. Its purpose was to uh, mostly study the interior of Mars, but we want to grab gather more weather data as well. Uh, so we make use of that. And it even goes back to the Viking days. We have data from some of the Viking missions about uh, the Mars weather. So let's kind of work from this image right here. And I, I chose Seattle just as a, uh, a place we could compare to. Uh, but this is back on June 21st. It's the latest data that's come down from Curiosity in this case. And it's showing the, the temperatures and it's showing the uh, air pressures that have been uh, recorded recently. And I like this view because it, it lets us compare things to something we're more familiar with. It, it's winter in Gale Crater right now where Curiosity is, and it's very close to the, the equator. Um, and we'll talk about seasons some, that's summer here. Uh, it was a high of 72 in Seattle that day and a low of, of 53. Uh, but if you look at those temperatures over on Mars, negative 13 and negative 112. So it, looks like a desert and it is technically a desert because desert is determined not so much by temperature but more about the amount of moisture in the air and it's very very dry there so it's a desert as well but it's very very cold so as you're thinking about your your mars missions definitely consider how cold it gets on mars and if you're building habitats above ground then you've got to have some way of heating those uh, you may want to consider building habitats below ground because that's going to solve some of your heating problems and also solve some of your radiation problems. But when it, it comes to the story of Mars weather and, and, and the story of the Mars atmosphere, it's that bottom row that's the most important. So those are hectopascals, that's what the HPA means. And as you can see, it was about eight on Mars and a thousand on, on the Earth. So you know even less than a hundredth of the atmosphere. And that's really going to be one of the big challenges when it comes to putting people on Mars is how the heck do we deal with the fact that there's just a little bit of atmosphere and it's the wrong kind of atmosphere for humans. So let's keep it moving. Let's start with this temperature piece. And then let's move on to, so we talked a little bit about temperature. Let's talk about that pressure. Um, Mars actually breathes. Uh, that's my term, but you'll, you'll see what I mean. And it happens both daily and seasonally. So what you're seeing here is two graphs over uh, about a Martian day. And this is with the Curiosity rover. And it's measuring the atmospheric pressure over time. You see how it goes up for a little bit and then it dips way down. And we see this pattern over and over and over again. One was taken on Sol 31 one was taken on Sol 93. So two different seasons there. So you can see that the, uh, the pressure fluctuates by seasons as well. What we're seeing here is solar heating. So the atmosphere heats up during the day as the sun is, is uh, showing down on it. And when air heats up, it expands. And when it expands, that pressure goes down. So that's what you're seeing here. You know, This is morning time, this is daytime. As the sun sets, and things start to cool, you know, not only does that air start to condense some and become more dense, you know, thus the pressure is going to go up, but we actually see air come from the opposite side of the planet that is now being heated up by the sun will rush around to the, the, uh, to the night side of the planet and you know, fill in that, um, uh, start to fill in that, um, that, that missing air. And this happens every day, cycle over and over and over. Uh, and I was out at JPL, Jet Proportion Laboratory, that's responsible for these, these missions a couple of years ago. And I was out in the Mars yard. Uh, so the Mars yard is a, an area that's set up with, with sand and, and, and hills and, 
and things like that, where they have full size version of the rovers that are, are uh, up on Mars, they can use to test things out. And the roboticist that was, was showing me around um, picked up a rock and he showed it to me and it was very, very pointed. And he was telling me why they had it there and, and why uh, they even cared about it. We see those kind of pointed rocks on Mars, particularly in the area where um, where Curiosity has landed. And it's down in a crater. And there's a mountain in the middle of that crater. Uh, the geologists are, are interested in it, but it, it, it's pointed uh, less for geologic reasons and more for weather reasons. And it's because of this right here. Every day there's the cycle of air coming in and air coming out. And it tends to happen in opposite directions. So when that air rushes in, it picks up sand, it picks up dust, and it rushes over those rocks. Over thousands and millions of years, as this happens over and over and over again, it will actually sharpen that rock to a point. And the reason the roboticist cares about this is his robot's got to roll over that, and it was tearing the wheels apart. So they had to come to this understanding about what was causing those rocks to be sharp, uh, but also um, how to avoid them so they could keep the, um, the wheels in good shape. So that it just kind of goes to show you how all these different sciences your robotics, geology, uh, the meteorology of it, um, and, and of course the physics and the math, they all kind of come together to help solve some problems. So the other thing that Mars does breathing wise, well, actually here's um, another view of this. This is from the InSight lander um, that I was mentioning earlier. You can see that daily ebb and flow of the air pressure as one side heats up, the air rushes around, and then the opposite, opposite happens as night falls and then the other side of the planet is heating up over and over and over. This is in a completely different place than the, the, the Curiosity rover data that I showed you. We see this with every single mission that we put up there. So the other thing that happens, and this one absolutely fascinates me, the other breathing that Mars does is seasonally. So we're talking over the length of the Mars year. Now, a Mars year is a little bit longer. It's almost two years instead of just a, a, the year that we see here on Earth. Uh, and as that happens, uh, we see the air pressure change too, not just day to day uh, or hour to hour during the day, but day to day over a longer period of time. The reason this happens is what's happening up here in the top in these animations. One of these is showing you the North Pole over a Mars year. The other is showing you the South Pole over the Mars here. There's polar ice caps on Mars. These ice caps are made to some degree of some water ice, but it's mostly carbon dioxide, frozen carbon dioxide, you know, better known as dry ice. And as the overall temperature heats up during the summer and when Mars is closer to the, uh, the sun to some degree, those polar ice caps melt and it puts carbon and goes straight from frozen carbon dioxide to gaseous carbon dioxide, which means it goes back up into the atmosphere. So what you're seeing here is the ebb and flow as it gets to be winter, and that carbon dioxide precipitates out of the atmosphere in the form of snow. It actually snows carbon dioxide on these poles. Uh, it gets pulled out of the atmosphere and that pressure goes down. Well, as things start to heat up, as it moves in towards the summer, um, those polar ice caps melt again. They don't melt to water or, or liquid. They melt back into gaseous carbon dioxide, which gets pushed up into the atmosphere. And we see those pressures going up. Uh, and the different dot patterns you see here are from different years. So you can see that the, the pattern is exactly the same year over year over year. So this is very, very predictable. And I've even got some data I pulled back from the Viking missions you know, back in the 70s. And you can see it's the same pattern once again. Uh, this is weather, this is climate. So uh, there's some variance to it. And that's what you're seeing with the scatter plot here. Uh, but you can see the overall pattern that's being formed here. The other thing that's worth pointing out too that uh, I don't think we, we point out enough. You see that gap in the red line? That's just data loss. And that happens sometimes. You know, perhaps there was something wrong with that um, a particular instrument that the engineers back here on Earth were able to figure out the solve. Um, maybe it, it just wasn't reporting for a while and it started reporting again. We'll see gaps in this data sometimes. That doesn't necessarily mean we should mistrust it. it just means that something went wrong and they were able to fix it. 
So let's talk about the um, uh, talk about the the seasons a little bit more because that's an important thing to understand with the weather. Here is the seasons drawn out um, for both Earth and Mars, and you see how they don't really line up. Now, we think of the seasons here on Earth as being three months each, uh, and, and they're close, but only spring and summer are exactly the same. Autumn and winter are a little bit shorter. But on the whole, you can just stare at that, that graph and see that yeah, they're pretty, pretty close to each one of them is a quarter of a year. That's not the case with Mars at all. Uh, spring is quite a bit longer. Summer is a little bit longer. Uh, autumn's relatively short, and then winter's a little bit longer. So those variations in the length of the seasons can also impact weather too. Um, Mars has seasons, um, and we know it has seasons in large part because it has an axial tilt. So this is a really cool animation that um, an astronomer put together uh, that I love because it, it shows you what's going on both with the rotation and the axial tilt. So. The reason we have seasons here on Earth is, is not because of how far we are away from the sun, which does vary. We're coming up on um, perihelion, which is the point where Earth is, I'm sorry, we're coming up to aphelion, point where the Earth is farthest away from the sun. That happens in the summer here in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, and that seems a little surprising, you know, it's summertime, it's hot outside, but um, you know, why are we so far away from the sun? Well, that's because that's not how uh, how seasons work. Seasons are driven by axial tilt and how direct that sunlight is hitting us. So the thing I want you to, to get out of this, other than, hey, some of these uh, are pretty wacky and how they're kind of rotating on their sides, which you may or may not have known about. That's something that's worth looking into too. But let's focus in, focus in on Earth and Mars. Look at those two numbers. They're really, really close. So the seasons work very similarly on Earth and, and Mars. The big difference, though, is something called eccentricity. So eccentricity is a, a measurement of the orbit of, of anything, in this case, a planet. And we measure it using a number. Mars orbit is less circular. And that's what's driving those kind of variations in the length of the seasons there. Uh, here on Earth, our orbit is pretty close to circular. It's not exactly circular, but it's close. Mars is even further off. Um, Mars this year is 687 days. Ours is 365. That's simply because it's so much farther out. But when you look at this eccentricity number and see those, those numbers there, zero is a perfect circle. And as you get closer to one, that gets more and more squished, more and more elliptical. Uh, look at Mars there. It's, it's pretty wacky. It's quite a bit uh, elliptical. And that's what's driving those kind of weirdness with the, uh, uh, with the seasons. So the last thing I'm gonna leave you with before we take some questions is, I wanted to show you the team when it comes to uh, JPL's Mars program. There's a number of missions that are up there. They all have people that are, are working on them. These are kind of the Martians here on earth. And this is front of the administration building at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory out in Pasadena, California. And you name a job at NASA, you name a job, and they're represented here. You know, there's, of course, um, there's a lot of scientists, there's a lot of engineers, there's the roboticists that are taking care of those robots and designing them and building them. There are, uh, there's atmospheric scientists, there's a lot of geologists in there, because one of the big things that we study on Mars is its geology, because we can tell a lot about its past, including its meteorological past, uh, by looking at the rocks. They, they have a, a good record there. But there's, it takes a lot of people to, and a lot of different kind of jobs uh, to, to study Mars. So with that, I've got time for questions. Wonderful presentation and absolutely wonderful videos and graphics. Great, great, great. Very, very informative. Thank you so much. Um, I have some questions. Um, why would we care about the dust storms and the dust? If we're humans on Mars, how would that affect us on our ground mission? Excellent question. And we absolutely must care about the dust storms and we must prepare for them because they, we know that they will be coming. Um, we have been studying Mars long enough to see some curiosity there, to see that these 
dust storms come really, really big dust storms to the point where they will encircle the entire planet uh, come on a, a fairly regular basis uh, every several years. That's important for um, a reason that we've learned through these robots. So when you send a person to Mars, they're going to need, um, you're going to need to feed them. You're going to need to make sure that they have water. You're going to need to make sure they have oxygen. And you're going to need to make sure that they have shelter. And what's underlying all of those things is you got to have power. You've got to have electricity. So think about the last time the power went out at your house, how kind of miserable that was. It was probably only out for a couple of hours and you couldn't use electronics. You couldn't watch TV. Uh, you couldn't do all those things. That's a big deal on Mars though, because uh, we're likely going to have to generate atmosphere uh, using uh, uh, methods that, that require electricity. So if we can't make electricity, we probably can't even make our air. If we, and we're probably going to have to clean our water using electricity. Bottom line, we need electricity. How do you generate electricity? Well, there's two ways. I mentioned the um, the, the nuclear powered uh, way that the uh, the rovers, uh, the Curiosity and the Perseverance rovers use, but we're also going to use solar power. Dust storms leave dust on those solar panels, just the regular dust of the of the uh, just being there, you know, not even in a dust storm situation. And that impacts solar production. And that is what has uh, ended the mission for quite a number of our mission or quite a number of our spacecraft that are there that are powered by solar power. Uh, and even if you've got a human out there to clean the solar panels off, those periodic dust storms become so thick that it completely blocks out the sun those solar panels will not work at all. It becomes as dark as night uh, underneath those uh, dust storms. So we have to pay attention to those dust storms and know that they are coming and be able to continue to do what we need to do to keep the astronauts alive, quite frankly, uh, knowing that there may be dust storms that last for you know, possibly weeks at a time. Wonderful, um, great answer. So, um, Elise or Elias is asking, would weather patterns on Mars have potential to significantly harm or put an expedition at risk? Are they more frequent or dangerous in relation to Earth? They're definitely not more dangerous. And the reason for that is that very low atmospheric pressure. Um, if you were to walk outside on Mars, take your spacesuit off and feel the wind, you know, we see winds of uh, 15, 20 miles an hour, you know, pretty, pretty regularly uh, from these, these instruments that we have on, on these spacecraft, you wouldn't even be able to feel it. Because that air pressure is so low, there's not enough stuff to move, air molecules to move. So in that regard, it's not really that dangerous. The most dangerous part uh, was kind of covered in that previous question, and that's the dust storms. Um, if you have seen the movie The Martian, it actually portrays what weather would be like on Mars pretty well, with one very big exception. Uh, as Mark Watney's driving across the, the plains there, you can see dust devils off in the distance. We talk about dust devils some. That very opening scene where the crew has to leave Mars because of a dust storm um, and Mark Watney is hurt in that dust storm or an antenna or something like that, pierces a spacesuit because it's being blown uh, by this dust storm. Absolute fantasy. And I, I love the movie. Uh, I think they did a good job with it. And I'm of the opinion that you get one bad piece of science to push this, the story along. And, and they, they got it out of the way very, very quickly. So what you see in that dust storm and where it looks like a very dangerous place, it's not. But again, it's that very low atmospheric pressure. There's just not enough air molecules there to, to do much harm. I think I mentioned that same thing about the Martian the other day when I was <laughs> talking to the kids. Um, do we know how strong the dust storms can be? Um, and I think you may have already answered that. Yeah, they, the biggest problem with the dust storms is blocking out the sun and the loss of visibility. And they're really, we can, we can kind of tell when it's gonna happen. You know, here in North Carolina, we, we know this time of year is when we typically get 
thunderstorms in the afternoon. And it's just because of the way that the heating of the soil works and there's humidity in the air. But we can tell that's more climate. We can tell the, the climate clues that, that let us know that a dust storm might be coming, that the, this is the right conditions for a dust storm. But one of the big struggles is figuring out how long they're gonna last. I haven't figured that out yet. So keeping these weather instruments coming on new missions that, that go to Mars, the more we can study that, the more data we have, uh, the, the better we'll be able to predict things like that. And one day we'll have a, probably have a Mars weather report, just like we have on the evening news. Okay, Angela wants to know, since there are a lot of dust storms, what material would you suggest the shelter be made out of to prevent dust damaging the shelter? That's a really good question. It's not a material scientist, so these are, are guesses on my part. Um, the biggest problem with those dust storms, if you're protected again in there, again, the winds aren't a problem, so you don't have to worry about that. Uh, and the, the winds aren't any stronger necessarily during the dust storms. Dust storms are more about the dust hanging in the atmosphere. And the dust deposits would be something that I would worry about. If you've got to build a habitat for astronauts or equipment or um, uh, say something like a greenhouse to grow food, you need to make sure that it's going to be able to handle the weight of the dust. It's not going to be a ton of it. Uh, it's not going to be uh, very dense. And if you've got to test that here on Earth, I would use something like cake flour or talcum powder is even closer to the right weight. So if you can, whatever you build and, and you can pile up on top of uh, uh, your, uh, your structure and you know, pile some talcum powder up there and it'll hold it, you're, you're probably in good shape. Keeping in mind that testing things here on Earth that you're eventually gonna put on Mars is particularly challenging because the gravity is quite a bit different. Uh, the mass of the, the planet, of course, is much, much smaller. So gravity is much less on Mars than it is here on Earth. Okay, and um, Tissia would like to know, is Mars volcanically active or does it have Mars quakes? It does have Mars quakes. And I suggest you take a look at the InSight mission. If you go on nasa.gov and you search on InSight, and get some really good information about that mission. That is what InSight was sent to go look for, was Mars quakes. And it had a seismometer that was set down on the ground, very similar to seismometers we have here on Earth, and was, was looking for tectonics, was looking for motion within the, uh, the center of the planet, was mostly trying to understand the center of the planet. It is not volcanically active. We do know that there have been volcanoes in the past. Olympus Mons is the largest volcano in the solar system. Uh, and it's, it's there on Mars, but it's been there so long, even its, its sides, uh, the slope going up to the top of the volcano are falling away. So it's long since dead. A lot of what we saw from the InSight mission uh, seismically was asteroids uh, hitting the planet you know, maybe even on the opposite side of the planet. And that will cause vibrations within the planet. And, you know, one geologist described it to me as Mars will ring like a bell when it's hit by uh, an asteroid. And, you know, they're not terribly big ones, but yeah, that's where those craters come from. A lot of them come from uh, being struck by asteroids. So shorter version of the answer, not volcanically active. We don't see plate tectonics like we see here on Earth. Um, but there is some seismic activity there, uh, both from within the planet and from sources such as asteroids. Okay, and Cal would like to know, so we know Martian dust has concentrations of perchlorate salts. If breathed mm -hmm. in, it can impact human health and can also destroy machinery. How do you mm -hmm. think we can allow crew members to get in from the outside and make sure these toxic salts hmm. stay outside? Yeah, I'm not a doctor, so I can't really uh, comment too much on that. But I, I, as everybody in my family but me has asthma, I'm uh, I'm sensitive to those uh, those kind of things about. Uh, you know, breathing helps. So we, we definitely want to protect our astronauts there. Uh, most of the designs that I've seen around this have a, a similar kind of design that we see 
in northern parts of the U.S. or anywhere that it's cold, where you have a mudroom and you have a, an area that you can enter uh, when you're coming in from the outside to remove those things that you wore outside and leave them in that mudroom. And I've even seen some designs for uh, Martian vehicles where the astronaut who's driving the vehicle around, if they need to, to get out in a suit and move around some outside of the uh, vehicle, instead of you know, having a door to the vehicle, going outside, or putting on your, your suit inside the vehicle, going outside, coming back in, taking off your suit and bringing all that bad stuff that you're, you're talking about there uh, back into um, you know, that more or less clean environment. The suit kind of attaches to the side of the vehicle. And the, the outside stuff stays outside and the astronaut, uh, you know, kind of stays in a, uh, in a more clean environment. So it's all about, I think, leaving those dangerous things that you're talking about outside as much as possible, either through a mudroom kind of situation where you, you come in and you're able to take off your suit, but you leave that suit in that environment. And then you go into a much cleaner environment. Uh, for the, for the rest of the day to to eat to work to sleep whatever uh, and uh, keeping this separation of um, the clean and the dirty if you will okay uh, another question what are the dangers of solar radiation on Mars and how can we protect ourselves on a human mission yeah those are pretty significant. And the last couple of rovers, Curiosity and Perseverance in particular, have had uh, instruments on board to measure that solar radiation. Um, there's quite a bit more radiation that the astronauts will be uh, exposed to when they're on the surface of Mars. And there's some different ways that, that they can be protected by that, uh, protected from that. You know, some built-in protections within the, the spacesuits themselves when they're out and about but they're gonna be spending most of their time in habitats. They're gonna be spending most of the time in you know, areas that they can move around, um, they can eat, they can sleep, they can do their work. So we've gotta protect those habitats too. Uh, there's two options that I've seen that are kind of interesting. One is encasing those habitats in water, in bags of water, uh, because the radiation doesn't pass through water very well. And you're gonna need the, the water anyway. Uh, so perhaps you, you store your extra water in the walls of your, um, in the walls of your your habitat, uh, but probably what makes even more sense is to go underground. Is to have these habitats under the Martian soil, uh, because that's going to help with that temperature problem that we were talking about earlier. Uh, you're no longer having to deal with the the negative hundred some degree temperatures because you're you're going to be underground. The temperature is much more regulated there, uh, but that radiation doesn't pass through the ground as well. So we might have to dig down uh, for places for our astronauts to live. And that was actually the next question, expanding on why we should be underground. <laughs> yes, yeah. that, that, that's why, that's, that's really, really hard because we've got to take whatever we need to, to accomplish that, the, the equipment to dig, uh, we've got to take that up there as well. Uh, maybe we uh, build uh, habitats out of, of bricks that are made from the soil there and have thicker walls, you know, built out of, of, of soil and that will help block some of the, the radiation. The radiation problem isn't going away either. We don't have a significant radiation problem here on Earth uh, because we have a magnetosphere. We have a, a magnetic donut uh, that is surrounding our, uh, our, our Earth and it's, it's strongest as we get towards the uh, or provides the most protection, I should say, as we get closer to the equator. Uh, that doesn't exist on Mars. And that you know, Maybe there was one there a long time ago, back when it actually had an atmosphere. It hasn't always looked like this. You know, there used to be a much more atmosphere and you know, enough atmosphere that liquid water could actually exist on the surface. It can't, there's not enough atmosphere there. Uh, but that magnetosphere also provides some protection against some of that radiation. So that's not gonna change. We're gonna have to deal with that radiation problem, perhaps digging down, perhaps using that soil and, and, and constructing up, but the, we're gonna to have to have some, some way of controlling that and keeping that from getting the astronauts sick. Okay, any other questions? 
I don't want to keep you. Um, thank you so much. Absolutely wonderful presentation. We appreciate your participation and all of your knowledge and uh, keep doing good work. We really appreciate it. Well, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm excited to hear more about uh, what you guys are, are cooking up here. We will keep you updated. It will be <laughs> all published on our website. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Students, um, we are waiting for the next speaker and he may have been called away. I am in contact with him now to see if he is available. It's uh, Matt Huthang Baloo should is supposed to be speaking. He's scheduled to speak. And let's just give him another minute or two and see if he makes it. So if you need to take a break while we wait, feel free to go um, take a couple minutes and check back and see if our speaker is available.
Okay, students, I believe um, Dr. Fengvalu has been called away. I will try to get him rescheduled. Um, and I will, if he comes in the next few minutes and gets back to his office, I will email you all immediately and let you know. So check your email within the next 10 minutes and see. Um, otherwise, this afternoon, we have Trudy Hugenboom. She will be speaking at the 1.30 Pacific Daylight Time, um, at same as the last few days. So 1.30 Pacific Time. And if you have any questions, please email me. If you don't hear from me, then Dr. Thang Ballou has been called away permanently and I will try to get him rescheduled. Um, make sure to um, keep an eye on the syllabus as it changes. We are continuously adding each talk each day to the YouTube channel. Um, so those uploads will be happening. We will probably be using Discord for team communication. I'm starting to form the teams now. What I have on the document is tentative as new people are being added every day to the class. So um, hopefully by Friday, I'll have a pretty good idea of who's on what team um, that is subject to change. So just keep an eye out for that information. Um, hopefully I'll be able to tell you tomorrow which teams are which and you can start um, working um, over the weekend. So let's see one more check. Okay, so for now, let's take a break till 1.30 Pacific time and check your email in the next 10 minutes to see if Dr. Thangbalu has returned to his office. Otherwise, I will see you later on today. Thank you guys. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome.